Okay, whatever that halo is, uh, I'm assuming it's the same thing that you see in all the uh, uh, the iconography. You know, it'd be nice if it was sort of shifted over here. I just I don't know what that is. Anyway, uh, you may not be seeing it; it's showing up on the uh, on the image here. But uh, sound was good, so off we go. Welcome. Today's uh, and this week's study time is oriented around preparing the way. And today we're going to be reading some more about John the Baptist, a little more complete. Uh, Mark sort of just summarizes it very quickly and simply. And uh, we're going to go back to Matthew where we're going to hear a little more, a little more clarity about John the Baptist, who was, of course, the one sent to prepare the way uh, for the Lord. And uh, so I'd invite you now to join with me as we pray together. God, our Father, who did send forth thy Son to be King of kings and Prince of peace, grant that all the kingdoms of this world may become the kingdom of Christ, and learn of him the way of peace. Send forth among all people the spirit of goodwill and reconciliation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, as I said, today's scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It is found in uh, the third chapter. Um, it is uh, the verses 1 through 12. So uh, we're going to go ahead and read that. Um, if you find my hair less distracting today, or my lack of hair less distracting, anyway, <laughs> I know I do. Uh, Kathy cut my hair last night, so, you know, pray for her and give thanks to God. Let's read. <clears throat> Uh, hopefully they will leave a message. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who has was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Uh, it doesn't end in a real positive positive note, does it? Uh, it it's a fascinating thing. I, the first church I was at, I, I don't know, it wasn't probably the first one, but at some point in the first year that I was there, I preached from this passage. Um, I was there as an associate pastor. There was a senior pastor. I preached once a month. Came time and uh, and I preached this passage. So it must have. I suspect it probably was around this time of year. And a very good friend who uh, uh, was uh, we just really had met was there, and uh, we became very good friends as time went by. And he's never forgotten this, and I, I haven't either, uh, honestly. But I started out the sermon by standing up there and looking out at the congregation and growling out in my most uh, John the Baptist voice that I thought I could muster, you know, 
Uh, and I said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And there was one person in that group who never forgave me for that. And I mean literally, uh, was something of a, uh, well, he, just put it this way, he was not a fan, and he used every possible opportunity to express that. And he had been somewhat okay to this point, but I saw a look come over his face as I was saying it, and it wasn't because I was saying it at him specifically. Um, I just, I really wanted them to catch the, the sense of what, what John was saying here to the most religious people. And, uh, and I guess he did, and he didn't like it. And uh, and that was the end of, of my ability to minister to him in any way that I would like to have. Um, interesting stuff. At any rate, so as we see this, you know, people are coming to John. They're streaming to John. Why? Because they're desperate. Honestly, this format, the, the Facebook uh, format, the Facebook Live stuff, has been something that has done more than I would ever have imagined that it would do. Uh, it's diminished as time has gone by to a degree in terms of the number of people who have been on to uh, uh, check it out or been consistently on. But I have attributed the, I don't even want to use the word success, but I've attributed the attentiveness of people to these devotional times and to the worship service to going through difficult times and looking for some hope, looking for something positive, looking for a measure of the presence of the reality of God in this time. And there has been something which is uh, very little short of desperation. I think in most of our lives, I'm not negating myself from that at all. And people have desired to seek God because when we really come up against the wall and there is no hope for stumbling even forward, we have to look up, don't we? And so that's where the people were in those days. Um, as, as I've said many times, this was a time of, of abject poverty throughout most of Palestine. This was a time when the Jews were really under Roman control and under the Roman heel. They were financially bereft by Roman taxes. They had very little. And again, I would point out to you that uh, so when Jesus came and when he started picking his disciples he picked people who had to give up something significant in those days and follow him without anything but faith. So they left the boats. Uh, they may not have made a lot of money fishing, but they always had food. Uh, Matthew left being a tax collector. He, he was not just relatively wealthy, he was almost certainly very wealthy, uh, because of the job that he had, and he left it to follow Jesus. So as you, as you look at the, uh, the lives of the, of the folks who were following Jesus, Paul, um, Paul was sort of a rich young ruler in many respects. He was not the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, and, and Jesus said, yeah, okay, you're, you're cool, except for this one thing, you got to get rid of all you possess and give it to the poor and follow me. And, uh, and that guy could not get to the point of following Christ because he couldn't get rid of the stuff that was in the way. Um, anyhow, so, uh, but, you know, Paul, too, was a rich young ruler. Very highly thought of. Really, the up and coming. He was the, you know, the kind of guy that the entire nation pinned their hopes on. So, you know, this is the, these are the kind of people that Jesus chose. They weren't necessarily educated. They weren't in terms of being profoundly educated, although they were a probably, in comparison to our day today, they were educated as well as our kids are. 
um, they all could read and write. Yeah, that was Jewish. So, at any rate, um, but the rank and file of people at this time are desperate for something. Desperate for something. And they see hope in the person of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is out in the wilderness eating locusts, wearing uh, camel's hair garments. Um, by the way, that was a that was a form of self torture. Uh, nobody who could would have worn camel's hair. I mean, it short fibers, and if you know anything about wool or you know uh, hair, you know weaving or felting or whatever, the more tips that stick out the more prickly it becomes. And so you have things like cashmere, very long fiber. You have a lot less ends sticking out to prick you. Uh, camel's hair, not so much. It was definitely uncomfortable. So he was living at the lowest level of life. You know, he's eating wild honey. That sounds good, except how do you get wild honey? You're probably going to get stung, you know. Um, he's eating wild honey and he's eating grasshoppers, wearing camel's hair. And people are going to him by the droves to hear his message. Why? Because he was telling them the truth. They were actually desperate enough to listen to the truth. Are we that desperate yet? You know, this the whole COVID thing is a part of preparing the way, folks. I'm not saying Jesus is going to be back next year on, you know, March 3rd or any I mean any of that stuff. I'm not I don't I don't play that game. I don't want to play that game. I don't want to mess around with that at all. Uh I believe Jesus is coming back soon. But that might mean 100 years as opposed to the last 2000, you know. Um so I believe he's coming back, but it is not for me to know the day or the time. It is for me to be prepared myself and to prepare the way. And I think the, the self-preparation part is never going to come in our lives unless we are pushed. It is in those moments of deepest despair, again, when we're up against the wall, we look up and we see God, and it pushes us to depend on the Lord. Up until that point, we can depend on ourselves. You know, I got a good job. I can, uh, I can, I can get. You know, I make enough money. I'm, I'm doing fine. Uh, it's no problem. You know, uh, I, I plug along. It's not what I want, but it's, it's good. You know, it's, it, uh, it suffices. I do this. I do that, uh, and. We need to be desperate. You and I need to be desperate. Not in despair, okay? But desperate enough to listen to the voice of one calling in the wilderness who calls us to repentance. Now, usually we think about repentance at Lent, <clears throat> right? You know, that's the time you give up stuff, you, you know, but... That's giving up stuff is not repentance. Turning away from behaviors and thought processes and and uh, uh, habits, um, turning around and going in the other direction. That's the whole concept of repentance. Stop, turn, and go. I, I found that in the last few months, um, especially with the Lyme disease that I have really needed, I, I mean, I can get so disoriented so quick doing something. And I'll think of something else. As I'm going into the kitchen to get something, I get up and walk from one end of the house into the kitchen, which is kind of at the other diagonal corner of the house from where I was. And I walk in and I will think to myself, oh, you know what? I want to do this. And I'll turn right around. I'll be within reach of getting what I went into the kitchen to grab and turn around and go do, you know, start to do something else, get about halfway there, suddenly go, oh, I really need, I need to go do that first. So I'll turn around and go back in and then, and, and 
I suddenly find that I have, you know, traversed that path two or three times without doing anything. And, and, and there's a, a moment when I, uh, the part of me that is, is functionally conscious and intelligent gets mad at the rest of me and says, stop, think, do. And, uh, and it's, it's probably more emphatic than that. And so, you know, I stop, I think, and then I go get what I was going to get, take care of that, then go on, move and do the next thing. Um, because that my mind isn't working in exactly the same way that it always has. Uh, and, and part of that is, um, is getting older. I don't think of 63 as old, uh, really. But uh, I remember watching my dad age dramatically in, uh, in the last 10 years, really, of his life. And uh, if you'd asked me my concept of my father when he died at just shy of 63, he was 62, I would have said he was, uh, he was getting old, getting elderly. And, uh, um, and so there is some of that, you know, that goes with age, but, but some of it goes with being sick. Some of it goes with the issues that are confronting us with the, the COVID thing. It messes with our minds, doesn't it? It leads us toward despair. But before we get to despair, real despair, we need to be desperate. And that's what the people were. The people were desperate for a change. And, uh, and folks, you and I, as Christians, have the change that is needed to dispel the desperation before it becomes complete and utter despair. So, uh, you know, John's out there and he's preaching a message of repentance. You know, you can't, you can't pay off your sins with sacrifices. People knew that. They understood it in their hearts. But it wasn't really what they were being taught. And so when, when you know, John starts talking about, you know, it's not enough to do a sacrifice. You need to be sorry for what you've done. You need to be repenting for your sins. You need to turn around and go in the other direction. And, uh, and so they had a concept of ceremonial cleansing as a part of the process of going through forgiveness for a sin. Uh, you know, ceremonial cleansing was a, was, a, uh, was a common mindset for them as Jews, you know. Uh, they had ceremonial cleansing for all sorts of processes, including wash your hands before you eat. That was a religious law. Uh, we we look at it now and we say, well, just common sense. Well, no, not in those days. It wasn't. That was that was God's sense offered to them. So they had this concept of ceremonial cleansing. So the baptism, which was was an extra step, a step beyond what they had been used to, really hit at their hearts. They understood it. It spoke to them at a deeply spiritual level, as well as at a physical level, as well as at a mental level. And so you have, you know, you have that three-part process that takes you out of the depths of sin where you are desperate and takes you into forgiveness and new life. Well, <clears throat> Pharisees and Sadducees weren't so desperate. They thought they had it all together. It irritated them that anybody else was listening to someone else who, uh, you know, wasn't them. And so they went in their self-righteousness and they checked out John as if somehow their approval was necessary. John already had God's approval to prepare the way for the Lord. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were only preparing the way for themselves. They really needed some serious repentance. Was it likely they were going to engage in it? No, because they thought they were fine. They were convinced they were fine. And uh, we need to be very careful when we get in that same position. And so as we look at these days, as we go through this pain, as we recognize the horror of what it is that confronts us 
in this disease, in society, in our very lives, there is an element in which we need to give thanks for God's call to repentance, to prepare the way within our hearts and minds for the coming of Jesus. Not as a little baby this time, but as a king. Because whether he returns in our lifetime or not, we're going to stand in front of him and we're going to recognize just how glorious he is, just how much king he is, just how powerful he is. And we're going to also recognize just how much he loves us. But there is a line you know, that's drawn very clearly here. The time is coming when the harvest will be done. That's what he's talking about here. You know, when he talks about the Lord on the winnowing floor, the harvest is done. The last of the wheat has been shaken out. All of the, the wheat kernels have fallen to the bottom, and what's left on top is just the chaff. And so with a pitchfork, you throw the chaff out of the pit where you have winnowed out the grain. You gather the grain together. It is your crop. It is. Uh, it offers life. It is life in and of itself to plant again in the spring, to eat, to be nourished by. And the chaff that's left, which has no value, is burned. Um, you know, that's the, uh, there's that within us which needs to be burned away. There's that within us which stands in opposition to the new life to the, uh, the, the grain of wheat, to that which represents and is, in fact, life. So, uh, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John came, and, and in this message, we see a very clear sense of what it is that he's calling us to do. Repent. I doubt there's a single one of us listening or speaking at the moment who does not have a need for some repentance in their life. Repent, which means to stop, turn, and do new stuff. And to follow, you know, to follow. We're, we're told in, in another place, uh, biblically, it's like the leveling of the hills, a straight pathway for the Lord. Within your life, is there a straight pathway for Jesus to walk to get into your heart at new levels in new ways? And then, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we need to start burning off the chaff and getting down to the kernels of wheat, the life itself, which God would place within our hearts. That's preparing the way of the Lord. Uh, we, you know, we, we don't uh, prepare the way of the Lord in the world very much. Right now, the most important thing for you and for I and for every individual on the face of this earth is to prepare the way of the Lord in us. And then offer that reality into the lives of others. Well, I would invite you to join with me in prayer. Lord, we have come before you as people went before John the Baptist. They went to hear him speak, to gain understanding, and to uh, respond to his call. They went to be baptized. Lord, I suspect that most of us has been, have been baptized. We need to claim that baptism and to live within it. We need you through the Holy Spirit to be preparing the way of the Lord within us and within us flowing out into the lives of others. Lord, we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Well, this morning it was me. And, uh, but ultimately... It's always God. Why? Because he loves you. You know, I mean, that really is the bottom line. God loves you so much. He's not going to force you, but he does love you and he wants you 
so desperately to allow him to help prepare the way within you. Maybe so in your life. Amen. See you tomorrow.